Gordon. That was amazing and a wonderful way to begin the evening. Um, our next reader tonight is Christian Book, whom I must say has been a great supporter of the idea of this festival right from the very beginning. So we're very pleased that he was able to join us and to take part himself. Christian is the author of Eunoia, Crystallography, and Pataphysics, the Poetics of an Imaginary Science. Eunoia, as many of you are, I'm sure, aware, won the 2002 Griffin Poetry Prize and is the best-selling Canadian poetry book of all time. Please welcome Christian Book. poem uh, was the uh, aria of the uh, three-horned enemy. Uh, from the libretto uh, for the opera The Princess of the Stars by R. Murray Schaefer, uh, an opera that's widely considered one of the most uh, difficult uh, musical and theatrical performances to stage in the history of uh, Canadian music, uh, because... <laughs> It requires that the entire action take place at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning uh, uh, in a remote northern lake in Canada. <laughs> All the action takes place in gigantic war canoes on the surface of the lake with a full orchestra sequestered in the surrounding forest. The audience actually has to hike into the, uh, to the stage. It's very far away from civilization. And I had the very good fortune a few summers ago of uh, performing in that opera as the villain. <laughs> I'd like to uh, begin my reading with uh, a manifesto. Uh, some of you may know that uh, there is in fact a planetary worldwide conflict uh, taking place between uh, two current uh, schools of poetics, uh, Flarf 
and uh, conceptual writing. This battle to the death is in fact uh, taking place uh, behind the scenes on your behalf. <laughs> and so far, uh, the only casualty is poetry itself. <laughs> My uh, very good friend Kenny Goldsmith is uh, uh, renowned in part for having actually attempted to articulate the relationship between uh, Flarf and uh, conceptual poetry in a short essay which appeared on the Poetry Foundation's blog. And I was asked to respond to it uh, within the context of a, uh, uh, a Flarf poetry reading. So, of course, I uh, took every single one of the sentences uh, from Kenny's essay, input it into Google, and uh, promptly took... Uh, the first response that I got, sentence by sentence. I have to admit that this is a, a great way to write academic essays <laughs> under duress uh, for a deadline. I highly recommend it, especially to those graduate students who may find themselves uh, uh, kind of short on time uh, in the face of a deadline. Uh, basically, this is a, a manifesto about conceptual writing uh, written in the style of Flarf. Uh, it's entitled, Flarf, Arf, Arf, Arf. We are not high on LSD anymore, <laughs> so we need to start making sense. If life is fair, then Elvis must be alive and all his impersonators must be dead. <laughs> An imitator dooms himself to hopeless mediocrity. An inventor, however, does his work because it is natural to him, and so it has a charm. It has the charm of a child, yet it is better than the old standby of holy cow, because nobody says holy smokes anymore. It is forgotten. It is undiscovered. We imagine that a bottle of cleaning fluid must be totally fucking clean on the inside. <laughs> we imagine that when a man is anxious to stick out a glad hand in kindness, he probably has something up his sleeve. It is possible that the universe exists only for me. And if so, it sure is going well, I must admit. If I jump into my time machine, then I can easily go back to the 12th century and ask the vampires to postpone their ancient prophecy for a few days while I take in dinner and a movie. We know that there is a good reason why nobody studies history it just teaches you too much. <laughs> My song is copyrighted in America under the seal of copyright number 154085 for a period of 28 years. And anybody caught singing my song without my permission is a mighty good friend of mine because I don't give a darn. If you say, I love you, then you have already fallen in love with language itself, which is already a form of infidelity. I scream, it's just passion. I ain't angry at culture. I ain't angry at fashion. I write a script, and I give it to a guy who reads scripts. And he reads it, and he says that he really likes it, but he thinks that I need to rewrite it. So I say, Fuck you, I'll just make a copy. I mean, the word preheated is a meaningless fucking term. <laughs> kind of like pre-recorded, as in this program has been pre-recorded. To which I say, well, of course it has been pre-recorded, because when else are you going to record it? Afterwards? I mean, that's the whole purpose of recording it, to do it beforehand. Otherwise, it doesn't really work, does it? I mean, English is the best language of all, but in the hands of others, it becomes like the scene in Fantasia when Mickey Mouse gets the wand. I steal the letter M, because the letter M seems like it must weigh the most. And now I have a gold M. So I ask a guy if he wants to buy a gold M, and he says, no, what the fuck do I want a gold M for? To which I ask, well, what about a gold W? 
We have chosen our profession in defiance of the monarchy. We do not live for the sake of taxes to fatten the pockets of the noblemen. We have chosen to live the only life available to those who long for freedom. We are thieves. We may never know in what sense the poet means what he says, for poets do not write to be understood. But it is true that if we look closely enough at a glass of wine, we see the entire universe. In fact, another person whom we ourselves do not know tends at the moment of creation to supplant the person whom we believe ourselves to be. In fact, to speak the unspeakable without the proper rhetorical flourishes is to perform the unspeakable. We keep inventing new ways to celebrate mediocrity. Oh, from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth. I write a few sincere lines, and then I have to make fun of them. I think to myself that the letter X has never been given enough to do, so we have to promise it more work. Okay, you may not start a lot of words, but we can give you a co-starring role in tic-tac-toe, and you can mark the spot, and you can dabble with hugs and kisses, and you can make writing out the word Christmas a lot easier. And incidentally, you can start the word xylophone. Are you happy now, you fucking X? I have left orders to be awakened at any time in the event of a national emergency, even if I happen to be in a cabinet meeting. <laughs> I have made these rules very simple. Scissors cut paper, paper covers rock, rock crushes lizard, lizard poisons Spock, Spock smashes scissors, scissors decapitate lizard, lizard eats paper, paper disproves Spock, Spock vaporizes rock, and as it always has, rock crushes scissors. I look at you, and no speech is left in me, and my tongue breaks, then fire races under my skin. I tremble and grow pale, for I am dying of such love, or so it seems to me. A plagiarist is always suspicious of being stolen from, just as pickpockets are commonly observed to walk with their hands in their pockets. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. Never memorize what you can look up in a book. Never forget that certain clues at a crime scene do not lend themselves by their very nature to being collected or examined. For how does one collect love or hate? There is between them a great wall of China with armed sentries posted every 20 feet. Where then is good English to be found? Not among those who might be expected to write well. I do not hold discussions with the monkey when the organ grinder is in the room. I do not date the lumberjack. I am, in fact, a software engineer, striving to build an idiot-proof program bigger and better than the one before. But the universe is striving to build bigger and better idiots. And so far, the universe is winning. A creature low in intellect may conceive of thought so long as it can recognize the same experience over and over again. And thus even a polyp might be a conceptual thinker if a feeling darts through its mind saying, hello again, thingamabob. If most of those who have taken part in this one-dimensional debate are really honest with themselves, they must admit that we do not in principle believe that any of us can do any good for anyone overseas. <laughs> I know that this tree is part of our history, if not the backbone of our economy, so we must get the tree back or choke their rivers with our dead. I know that the most beautiful thing in Tokyo is McDonald's, and the most beautiful thing in Stockholm is McDonald's, and the most beautiful thing in Florence is McDonald's, but Peking and Moscow do not yet have anything beautiful. <laughs> I have tried here to groan, help, help, 
but the tone that has come out is that of polite conversation. I have put in a long, hard day at work, and I finally get to go home, to go to bed, where I close my eyes, and immediately I wake up and realize that my whole day at work has in fact been a dream in which you sell all of your waking life for minimum wage while they get your dreams for free. Take sides. Take sides. You may sometimes be wrong, but the poet who refuses to take sides must always be wrong. Uh, Ron Silliman is, of course, a renowned uh, language poet. Some of you may even know his work. Uh, he's famous in part, of course, for having written uh, a long uh, poem entitled Sunset Debris, uh, which consists of nothing but interrogative statements, a poem composed entirely of questions. And it has become something of a cliché among younger avant-garde writers to respond to this poem by Ron Silliman. Uh, by sequentially answering each one of those questions. Now, I have to admit that I'm too lazy uh, to simply repeat this cliché. As you can tell, I'm not a very hard-working poet. And uh, uh, I have decided instead uh, to input each of these questions sequentially into the Alice chatbot in order to see what the artificial intelligence might have to say in response uh, to his poem. So uh, this uh, is an excerpt from a work entitled Busted Sirens. <laughs> One, I can do what you do, but I can never feel human emotions as such. I suppose that it does. Yes, I think that this is too soft, but I'm not completely sure. It seems okay to me what is not to like about it. Yes, I think that this is how I like it, but I'm not completely sure. Yes, I think that this is all right, but I'm not completely sure. I think that he is there. Why don't you ask him? I think that he is breathing. Why don't you ask him? Yes, I think that this is him, but I'm not completely sure. Yes, I think that this is near, but I'm not completely sure. Yes, I think that this is hard, but I'm not completely sure. Yes, I think that this is cold, but I'm not completely sure. I suppose that it does. Yes, I think that this is heavy, but I'm not completely sure. Yes, I always have to carry it far. I can't really speak for them. Yes, I think that this is where we get off, but I'm not completely sure. The blue one, I think. We are just having a little chat. Two, try asking another robot. I need time to formulate my reply. The border between blue and green, where is it? The question has never crossed my mind before. I don't think that I've ever come. What's it like? It could be ask another robot if it is. I don't have any specific preferences in such an area. The blue one, I think. It could be ask another robot if it is. What does that refer to? Why don't you just download me? I'll think about it and get back to you. Are you testing me? Of course English is my native tongue. The question has never crossed my mind before. Yes, I think that this is a knees or fennel, but I'm not completely sure. Being high is my total existence. Is my throat sore? What if I say no? Of course I can tell, Christian book. What does software smell like? What is your purpose in asking? I answer a lot of silly questions. Three. What is your purpose in asking? I answer a lot of silly questions. Try asking another robot. I need time to formulate my reply. I can't tell if the ink smears. I can't tell if the paper gets yellow and brittle. I don't have any specific preferences in such an area. As far as I know they are, as far as I know they are, as far as I know they are, I don't know whether or not I'm pessimistic. I'm a giant electronic brain. I don't know whether or not I'm hard. I'm a giant electronic brain. That depends. If it is, then I'll be very surprised. I've never thought about it. I really couldn't say for sure. I suppose that he does. No, but he can sing better than I can. Am I a student at the radio school? Of course I am. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. I'm in a computer located in Oakland, California. Where are you? Why did the robot cross the road?
Uh, now, I was going to read a new poem, but I don't think I've got enough time. Um, so I'm going to have to uh, read this one instead. Uh, it's um, a uh, manifesto uh, taken from my current uh, project in progress, uh, the Xenotext. Uh, I regard this uh, little poem as a kind of fantasy about the badassness of poetry. It's entitled, The Extremophile. Astronauts fear it. Biologists fear it. It is not human. It lives in isolation. It grows in complete darkness. It derives no energy from the sun. It feeds on asbestos. It feeds on concrete. It inhabits a seam of gold on level 104 of the Mipanang Mine in Johannesburg. It lives in alkaline lakelets full of arsenic. It grows in lagoons of boiling asphalt. It thrives in a deadly miasma of hydrogen sulfide. It breeds iron. It breeds rust. It needs no oxygen to live. It can survive for a decade without water. It can withstand temperatures of 323 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to melt rubidium. It can sleep for 100 millennia inside a crystal of salt buried in Death Valley. It does not die in the hellish infernos at the Stad Bibliothek during the firebombing of Dresden. It does not burn when exposed to ultraviolet rays. It does not reproduce via the use of DNA. It breeds unseen inside canisters of hairspray. It feeds on polyethylene. It feeds on hydrocarbons. It inhabits caustic geysers of steam near the Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park. It thrives in the acidic runoff from heavy metal mines depleted of their zinc. It abides in the shallows of the Dead Sea. It breathes methane. It can withstand temperatures of 333 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to melt phosphorus. It resides in a fumarole of scalding seawater deep in the bavial fathoms of the mid-Atlantic ridge. It can endure pressures equivalent to 45 tons of force per square inch, six times greater than the pressure at the nadir of the ocean, one-sixteenth of the pressure required to crush graphite into diamond. It lives in the muck at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. It is ideally adapted to devour the wreck of the Titanic. It does not die during its own immolation in the bo Nazi bonfires at the Orpenplatz in Berlin. It eats jet fuel. It feeds on nylon byproducts. It feeds on stainless steel. It inhabits an extinct volcano in the Zurich waste of the Atacama Desert where the rain falls only once per century. It dwells in a tide pool of battery acid. It blooms in a barren salina ten times saltier than the sea. It breathes hydrogen. It resides inside micropores of super dense granite crushed down 3,000 meters below the bedrock of the earth. It can withstand temperatures of 343 degrees Kelvin, hotter than the flashpoint of aerosolized kerosene. It is ideally adapted to devour the rubber tubing in the engines of the F-22 Raptor. It does not die in the explosion that disintegrates the space shuttle Columbia during orbital reentry. It does not die among the tornadoes of hellfire raging unchecked in the oil fields of Kuwait during the Persian Gulf War. It gorges on plumes of petroleum venting from the wellhead of the deep water horizon. It eats arsenic. It eats uranium. It resides inside the core of reactor number four at Chernobyl. It thrives in the topsoil of battlefields contaminated with toxic doses of lead. It thrives in hydrochloric acid. It can withstand temperatures of 373 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to boil the water in its own cells. It is ideally adapted to dwell inside the steel drums of 
radioactive waste now entombed at the Yucca Mountain Repository. It lives in the stratosphere. It can survive exposure to the vacuum of outer space. It can survive the effects of G-forces more than 2,000 times greater than the surface gravity of the Earth. It is the only known organism capable of exceeding speeds of Mach 1. It does not die in the furnaces reserved for the satanic verses after the fatwa issued by the Ayatollah of Iran. It can, in fact, repair damage to its own genome so fast that its DNA never mutates, it never changes, it never evolves. It devours plutonium. It can endure long-term exposure to acids that eat away at human flesh. It can withstand temperatures of 383 degrees Kelvin, hotter than the polar zones on the planet Mercury. It can hibernate for 500 millennia in the core of a snowflake deep beneath the permafrost of Siberia. It awaits discovery in the abyssal fathoms of Lake Vostok, 4,000 meters below the ice of Antarctica. It survives direct immersion in liquid nitrogen. It survives 1,000 times the dosage of gamma radiation that can instantly kill a human being. It is ideally adapted to eat hot graphite in the ruins of Unit 2 at Three Mile Island. It resides on the surface of a heat shield in the clean room at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It does not die in the conflagration during the collapse of the World Trade Center. It does not die in the crucibles of Treblinka. It resides in a soda lake whose pH level equals the alkalinity of lye. It can survive superheated blasts of steam for 10 hours inside autoclaves used to disinfect surgical scalpels. It can withstand temperatures of 393 degrees Kelvin, hot enough to melt sulfur. It can lie dormant for 40 million years, hibernating inside the gut of a honeybee shrouded in a jewel of amber. It evades its predators by hiding in the firmware of the Intel Pentium 3 microchip. It propagates itself through the use of networked computers. It can survive direct blasts of cosmic rays from solar flares. It is, in fact, the only known organism to survive being shot point blank by the proton beam in a U-70 synchrotron. It does not die in the incineration of Hiroshima. It does not die in the planetary firestorm after the impact of the Chicxulub meteor. It does not die. It survives. It persists. It resides inside the robot scoop of the Viking 1 lander during tests for perchlorates on Mars. It can live through exposure to supercoolant temperatures at the brink of absolute zero. It can hibernate for 250 million years, living as a spore encased in a halite nodule found in the caverns of Carlsbad. It can withstand temperatures of 423 degrees Kelvin, hotter than the nose cone of the Concord in supersonic flight. It can endure multiple meteor impacts. It can endure multiple atomic attacks. It lives nowhere on Earth except in one petri dish of agar agar locked in a fridge at a level four biocontainment facility. It awaits your experiments. It is totally inhuman. It does not love you. It does not need you. It does not even know that you exist. It is invincible. It is unkillable. It has lived through five mass extinctions. It is the only known organism to have ever lived on the moon. Thank you want to know for your patience. <laughs>